So for the Emerging Technologies Lab, our agenda is to develop the best quality academic scholarship in ways that are interwoven with engagement and impact outside academia. We really want to change how emerging technologies are understood in society and the agenda to engage with automated decision making is part of that. Now for us, Minna is, is our perfect speaker. Um, now, Minna Ruckenstein is Associate Professor in the Helsinki Centre for Digital Humanities and in the Centre for Consumer Society Research in Finland. Now, at the Centre for Digital Humanities, Minna advances the development of digital methods for social scientific inquiry. And in the Centre for Consumer Society Research, her group studies societal developments in relation to emerging technologies. So this means that Min is involved on both sides of emerging technologies, if you like. So she engages emerging technologies to do research, to produce new knowledge and to understand knowledge in, in, in ways that, that emerging technologies can support. But um, she also works to contextualise technology and technological developments in society and also to intervene when necessary in debates and in processes whereby technology is actually activated within society. Minna's work is also interdisciplinary and she engages with external stakeholders, again something that's core to our agenda in the Emerging Technologies Lab. And Minna's a frequent speaker at public events and a briefing policy makers and politicians, so again absolutely ideal to launch the, uh, of the first event of our automated decision making, rehumanising automated decision making network. Another key connection here is that um, Minna's collaboration with Algorithm Watch is actually at the core of some of the work she's going to be talking about today. And Algorithm Watch is also a partner for the Centre of Excellence in Automated Decision Making in Society. So another wonderful connection between our work in Scandinavia and our work here in Australia. Um, Minna also collaborates with many other industry partners, which really has enabled her to develop her work as an engaged researcher, as well as a very respected academic researcher. So I welcome Minna Ruckenstein to come and speak to us. Um, about her work in automated decision making. Finland is a small country. We have 5.5 uh, million people and, uh, and we just got a new prime minister, uh, a young woman in her 30s. So the most of the cabinet is now female led, which I hope will you know, also generate some beautiful uh, new trajectory when it comes to ADM systems. The performative stance of, uh, of Finland is, is that we wanna we want to do the best public services in the world with automation. And of course, it's very much performative because we're nowhere near there yet. But it means that we actually have an active debate around what these systems should be. And there are also genuine attempts to repair when things go wrong. Uh, Finland is also a very techno-enthusiast country. So, so it's, it's very engineer-led. So, uh, one of the things that I do in my work, I try to maintain the societal angle in those, in those debates, and that's sometimes fairly difficult because engineers say, well, you know, we'll just build the stuff and then we'll think about it later. But I think uh, in these questions, we also should think some things in advance, also because many of the failures are happening in the same time. So Sarah mentioned uh, our collaboration with... Um, Algorithm Watch, um, Berlin-based NGO that we started working with a bit more than a year ago. And of course, for an academic, it's always, always a bit, it could be a bit risky to start working with an NGO uh, that has a political agenda. But I have been very, very happy with this collaboration because basically uh, many of the things that we want to advance, um, they actually go to the same direction. So, uh, so this report came out uh, last January, and it was a mapping of what is going on in terms of ADM systems, automated decision-making systems in Europe in different countries. I think there were 12 countries uh, that did this mapping. It was a very fast exercise. The idea was that we would have five days to cover uh, policy initiatives, uh, AI strategies, and then we would have some cases which are instructive in terms of what is, what is happening now in terms of ADM systems. So if you don't know what automated decision making actually is, it consists of various technical things. So first of all, data needs to be produced somehow for these, uh, for these uh, 
decision making system. So, so, and the data could be, I will discuss cases where the data it comes from social media or emails, or it can come from uh, from how people use public services. They the, they leave uh, data traces. It could be public registers. So all kinds of data sets are possible. And then you have algorithms used to analyze the data, interpret the results of the data analysis, and to make decisions. And here we are very much on the same page with algorithm watch, that we always think that, OK, even if it's automation, there's a lot of human input in these processes. So, so the interpretation models are human-defined, decision-making models are human-defined, and those for, our, for us social scientists, there's something that we can look at. So Algorithm Watch thinks that automated decision making carries enormous dangers in terms of societal development, but also holds enormous promise. And this is now an empirical question. We need to actually learn to understand what those dangers are and what, what are the, the promises. There's also other ways to put this. You could say that technologies can be used for good and bad, but they're never neutral. This is something that is often said. Another thing is that the creator of this ADM um, system is responsible for its results. But paradoxically, the one who decides, de designs these decision-making systems is not necessarily in charge of what happens when they're implemented in, uh, in, in the real life. So when the user is coming to the picture, these systems might generate results that we don't really understand beforehand. So that means that in terms of ethics, we can't really decide the ethical questions beforehand because there are also a lot of questions that can arise in the process. So it's a very processual thing, thing that we have here. A very important, thing, important aspect in terms of a public sector is the fact that these systems need to be understandable. Otherwise, they cannot be held accountable for democratic control. And in, in, in societies, we need to understand what is it that is actually making this decision, and those decisions need to be democratically uh, followed. So what we did after we had published the report, you know, the report is kind of like, okay, so you have these little descriptions of cases. So what do we do then? So I decided that we will use those as a kind of discussion opener and have workshop with, we had them with journalists and students, and we asked them, what do you think about these cases? What, is, what interests you the most, raises most uh, pressing ethical questions? And people could also look at the differences between different countries, because if you look at Scandinavia and you, you look at uh, Southern Europe, for instance, we have a much more uh, kind of uh, policy agenda around these things. In other places, you know, the ADM might be implemented that people don't really think about the policy, uh, policy context as much. So one of the cases that was actually inspiring in terms of European development was, uh, was a case that I wrote about already before, the, for, before the, um, the report was published. It was about credit scoring. And credit scoring is a very typical ADM, uh, ADM uh, what is it called? Not implementation, but uh, now I lost, lost the word. Application. Application, yes, application. So ADM, ADM is, uh, credit scoring is used in, in like, I would say that probably in all places where it can be used. But this case was about uh, a new scoring, a credit scoring model that was used uh, for assessing people's credit worthiness when they did purchases in online stores. A young man in his 30s tried to buy building materials in this online store and for some reason he was denied the credit. So what he did, this was already in 2015, he appealed to the non-discrimination ombudsman in Finland and said that there must be something wrong with this system because I, wasn't, I was denied the credit and I'm completely credit worthy. So then uh, the non-discrimination ombudsman looked into the case, the company said, well, you know, we can decide who our clients, clients are, there's no problem here, uh, case was, was, uh, was was uh, put to tribunal and three years after the case came out and it's actually it was illegal so basically it was against in violation of anti-discrimination laws 
And uh, the company got a, a conditional fine of 100,000 euros if they continue with the case. And what was remarkable in this case was that had the applicant, so he was a young man living in Finland in a remote area, if he would have been a Swedish-speaking Finn or a woman, he would have met the company criteria for the credit. So what this case actually tells us is that when you are grouped in a wrong way, you might be discriminated against. And these ADM systems, they can, they can group you in ways where, with, that you don't, you, know, you don't see that in advance. After this, this, came, this case came out, there was also another case uh, where, where uh, age alone was a discrimination criteria. So 83-year-old man tried to buy something but couldn't get credit because, because the credit basically ended when he was, he, would, he, would have, he couldn't get a credit if he was over 80. So, so what this uh, case, uh, case kind of uh, uh, suggests us, ADM is used for strengthening, strengthening existing infrastructures. So it, it, is, it comes on top of layers of services that are already there. Automation is supposed to add efficiency to the assessment of applicants' creditworthiness. And there are a lot of things where we might think that this is, there's nothing wrong with it. It's good that these assessments are sometimes very automatic and very fast. But if the creditworthiness of an individual credit applicant is not taken into account, like was in this case, nobody looked at what was the individual data of that person, the assessment made may significantly differ from the profile of the individual credit applicant. So automation potentially discriminatory. Why was this case so inspiring? Because it tells us that we can actively engage with these systems. We can ban them as a society, we can fix them, we can re rethink them, and we can re reinvent them if they are not okay. Another case, which is also you know, something that is very uh, typical in this space, is various kinds of intervention models, alert systems trying to find something that is going, going wrong. So in this case, a Finnish company called Tieto and City of Espo, which is a, which is a, which is a um, city close to Helsinki, the, the, um, the capital of Finland, they did a pilot where they took a lot of customer information from anonymous social health and information uh, and early childhood uh, education and surveyed with this material, the data was huge, information of more than Half, half, uh, half a million citizens, uh, 3.7 million customer contacts, and they looked at that data and tried to find risk factors that would lead to childcare and or child youth psychiatry services needs. They found 280 predictive factors for service needs, which is, of course, for, for every social scientist, is like 280 predictive factors for service needs. What are they? I have been pushing for a year for City of Espo to tell me what those risk factors are. And finally, uh, one of the guys who was developing the system told me one of them, and it was flu. Flu, a predictive risk factor. So that means that the flu has to be correlated with something. There has to be a certain trajectory of flus, and then it might be a risk factor for, uh, for child and youth psychiatry service needs. So, uh, so this case, in each workshop that I've, uh, that I've held, is always talked about a lot. And these kinds of questions emerge. How do you set the machine sensitivity correctly in order to avoid false alarms? If you have 280 predictive factors, there's, there's going to be false alarms. How does the use of artificial intelligence modify the role and tasks of an employee? How does the social worker react to this system that alerts, alerts something and, and tells you that, okay, there's a child in need? Which might be also a good thing. If you design it very, very well, then, then you might find the child who actually needs early intervention. But, you know, this, this model was not seen as, as, as it would be there yet. Who takes the overall responsibility? Can an individual worker unknowingly affect another person's life chances? And then always lots of questions about citizen surveillance. 
So the citizen surveillance comes from the fact that in, in welfare societies like, like Finland, the idea has been that you operate on the collective level. Social harms need to be prevented on the collective level. But here you start to go on an individual level. You start to track individual people and predict those harms. And this goes very much against the idea that we have of society. Denmark had a similar uh, pilot. And I think that why I want to show you this, this is, it was also a pilot that never went forward. But I think that this is instructive because they actually had points for the parents in their intervention model. So diagnosed mental health in disorder was 3,000 points, unemployment 500 points. So this is kind of like regular back background factors. But then when you try to get to how these parents actually operate, you start pointing things like missing a doctor's appointment, 1,000 points, or missing a dental appointment. So here, here I think I want to... Um, kind of point towards this idea of behavioral tracking, which is possible with these kinds of systems, but again, from the societal perspective, it's, it can be deeply disturbing. As it was in Denmark, parents were saying, no, no, this is not good. Additional questions uh, that, um, that these cases uh, raise is data reuse in the public sector. If we take public sector data, who gets to use the data? Who can experiment with it? Who can learn with it? When you have companies doing that, they can also, also build services based on that data and then, you, then use them in ways that are not good societally. So, so you need to have some mechanisms that you actually track, you know, who gets to use this data, how, how and what you can do afterwards. A big, big area and the, the, question, uh, the debate has hardly started. How are these risk factors? How are they defined and who defines them? And what are their thresholds? You can't leave that to engineers. They're not, not uh, educated to do that. So do you have like some sort of like uh, public deliberations or, or how do you actually do that? Then the case that was very, very, very debated. Uh, these are two guys, they are psychologists who work in, uh, in hiring services. And I have been particularly talking to Juho Toivola, who is the second guy here. We wrote a little story about their company, which, uh, which wants to use emails and social media posts for personality assessment in hiring contexts. And, uh, and immediately when we had written it, uh, algorithm was uh, picked it. Uh, Matthias uh, Spielkamp and Nicolas Kaiser Drill they wrote a story about it um, with this title, Resist the Robot Takeover, when you know the digital minds were like, oh my, this is this is this is a bit too much. You know, we are a small startup company. We are not taking over the world. So so what they what they um, wrote in their piece was so a Finnish company has rolled out a new product that lets potential employees scan the private emails of job applicants to determine whether or not they would be a good fit for the organization. The company, Digital Minds, portrays is offering us something innocuous. If applicants give their consent, what's the harm? And Algorithm Watch uh, guys said, the truth is we don't know. We don't know the answer to that question, and that's what makes these new potentially intrusive and discriminatory te technologies like this one so scary. So in the workshops, yes, Lots of uh, talk about uh, what if you have these kinds of services in the hiring context, uh, that you actually have to open your emails or some sort of or social media posts for some sort of, uh, some sort of um, uh, assessment, and then somebody, somebody makes decisions based on it. For me, it was also very interesting because because this was kind of like when you work with, a, with an NGO, uh, it's something that you wouldn't do as a researcher. Uh, Algorithm Watch actually uh, reported Digital Minds to the Finnish uh, Data Protection Ombudsman. And they have been looking into the case. We don't have the final, uh, final response to it yet. And, and then I was kind of in the middle. I was writing about this company, and, and they said, oh, the Germans are after us. You know, they want, 
a precedence in the battle against algorithms and, of course, the data, the, uh, general data protection uh, regulation that came into force in, in, uh, in Europe was also part of this. So I thought that, okay, the, so this is a good, um, good possibility to now kind of uh, try, to, try to have like a conversation and, and understand a little bit better what is going on there. First of all, what the company actually does when it takes the emails and the social media, it actually used an existing uh, technology, IBM Watson's personality models. And here, Juha Toivola was, was kind of underlining to me that you have to understand that when people use assessment technologies in hiring context, it's performative. You know, all those assessments that we need to do, they're not objectively right. So he thought that you can kind of do this performative thing quicker. You don't have to do any surveys or anything. So he thought it was actually a, a good thing that they were doing. So then, uh, then the, the story was picked up in uh, Finnish media. Uh, the national broadcasting company wrote about it in, uh, in May, and they actually got a response from the data protection ombudsman. So data protection ombudsman said that the applicant's position is subordinate, questionable whether consent given can be genuine in, in this context. So in a hiring context, if you are, give me your email password, we're going to do this text analysis, personality based, can a person actually say no? What does the analysis of messages entail? <coughs> are, the, are the algorithms reliable? Well, I, say, I would say that they're not so reliable. It's like Enneagram. Is Enneagram reliable or not a horoscope? Because, because this IBM Watson is not hardly a, a personality assessment, a scientifically proven technique. But then he was also saying that emails are governed by the Confidentiality of Correspondence Act, like letters. But I think that the most crazy revelation was in this piece was that this company actually did not have any clients. So they had been talking about this case and they had one, one person who had consented to the analysis of work emails in a hiring context. So the whole, whole thing was, you know, around this like one person and less than 10 people had participated altogether, including social media text analysis. And that's when the guy said to me, it's a proof of concept. It's not an actual service. So what do these cases, what do they suggest? They suggest that people are most worried about ADM cases that have real life consequences. That this is, this is of course nothing surprising, but I think it's a good thing to really think about it. Hiring, employment, education, health, protection of children, caring for elderly. Those are the things that, that are ethically disturbing or ethically um, that people want to discuss them. But they also suggest that startup innovation logic they need careful scrutiny. Because what we have learned now is that they don't necessarily, these companies, separate between marketing talk and what is actually happening. So if we, if we for instance, you know, the whole digital minds case with their, with their one client uh, and the, the, the controversies around it, there's already like theses written about it. Uh, and then you think like nobody, nobody actually asked them, you know, do you actually have clients? Not us either. So uh, what they also tell us is that courts, ombudsmen, human rights advocates, civil society organizations and citizens, they are actually legal and political mandates that can be used in this space, used to regulate and control the use of technology, but they have to be used creatively. So, so that guy, 2015, that he actually got the idea that I can use the non-discrimination ombudsman here. It's a very, very creative move but also very inefficient if done case by case. So we do need like more broader regulation in this space. So then if we think about, you know, how to, how to kind of the last case that I will talk to you about is how do you then move, move forward to a kind of like a different model? So now we've had cases that have basically all of them have stopped or banned or whatever. But what if we want to kind of think about how to rethink this whole thing. So one of the cases in the report was about automated, uh, decision, uh, automated uh, content moderation. So content moderation is something that 
all platforms do. So it's it's a way to keep discussions or, or keep these platforms clean. And with AI and automated decision making, more possibilities are emerging that messages are never published or undesirable content is swiftly rejected. And we have, uh, we have looked at it from several perspectives and I think that one of the interesting things there is that in content moderation there's also also like this very uncomfortable situation in terms of how people work in these platforms. Uh, here's one article in Verge, uh, Bodies in Seats, that kind of discusses the fact that we have naturalized the fact that content moderators are confronted with this brutal dirt and waste. And it looks like there's actually, there's actually even like this, this global hierarchy of waste. So some of the most gruesome content goes directly to Philippines. So, so a, a very kind of, uh, kind of uh, interesting space where we have naturalized the fact that we actually traumatized some, some workers systematically. So to me, auto, uh, automation is a good thing in that space if it eases these people work in some ways. So this is a, a company that we wrote about, Utopia Analytics, and they're not modest. They say that they provide the finest machine learning services on the planet. <laughs> and it's, this is not a very Finnish characteristic. Finnish, Finns tend to be very humble, fairly humble in their doings, but you know, Marisa Napaukeri from Utopia Analytics is not one of those. So what they are building, they are building an AI product that mirrors content moderators' decisions. So, so content moderators are the ones who produce the data with their decisions, and then the machine mirrors those decisions and deletes offensive and inappropriate messages. So we have worked with content moderators. How do they actually see this kind of service? And, uh, and interesting was that what we discovered was that moderators were very discontent to their current, uh, to the current platform logic. The way, way content moderators work is organized. And in that space, they have actually turned to machines as potential saviors of their work-related ideals. So they're like, yeah, bring on better automation. We want good AI services in this space because, because they, they think that if there were better automated services, then they would have time to kind of manage the meta culture of these conversations. So they wouldn't have to have to be deleting individual messages, but they could kind of uh, take care of the platform culture as a as a whole. And so they, the, how they see the role of the machine and the and role of uh, the human uh, reviewer is we. Um, our piece that, that came out, you know, we kind of created this chart. And I think there's a lot of things that are, that are kind of uh, more generalizable. So what the machine does well, machines don't get tired in the automation, automated decision-making space. They are efficient in screening large data set. They're very consistent in following rules derived from the uh, tra training data. So if, if the machine learns something to do with the data, it does that. The human is, is really, really superior when, it's, when it comes to empathy or, or sensitivity to contextual information. But then human weaknesses are, well, they, they can't work 24 seven. Humans tend to be more inconsistent vulnerable when exposed to human inhumane content. And here is actually the, 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 the machine strength is that it cannot be psychologically harmed. So you can't harm a machine like you can uh, uh, the human. So from this, this um, what we can see in the, in the content moderation phase that what you actually need to do is you need to adjust human machines relations in a way that it would combine human strengths and machine strengths. But currently, in this content moderation space, what you actually see is that the machine logic is strengthened at the expense of humans, and the content moderators are reduced to these human algorithms. And this is something that, we, that I think that social scientists are kind of good at looking at these kinds of processes, that where does these kind of dehumanizing tendencies happen when 
a human needs to do something that machine could also do. So we don't want people to be, be cleansing devices. And of, of course, this is, this is not a new theme in social sciences. Uh, I'm thinking about Langdon Winner here, for instance, automated technologies. Um, so the core problem is that the human adapts to the power of the machine and not the other way around. So, uh, so then the rehumanizing, what does it mean in terms of all the stuff that I've, I've talked about? The technologies that I discussed, uh, they're not sophisticated technologies. So we need to think more how to use ADM systems in a way that could be societally beneficial. So first of all, it's good to make visible the human discontents when it comes to machines. It's good to make visible the forces and imaginaries in relation to ADM systems. And this ties to the, the broader uh, project that we are talking about. These are the things that we will be looking at in our rehumanizing automated decision-making network. So, so what the rehumanizing actually is, it's, it's kind of a starting point for exploring first the complexities of these ADM systems. Uh, we have to look at you know, the, the human there as a critical and creative agent in this human-machine relationship, what do people actually do around this system and with these systems? What do they aim at? And that rehumanizing move will push us to rethink and reimagine these socio-technical systems. 